found it very interesting that she, she moved fields and she now researches in the history and philosophy of science, which I think is fascinating. And so the title of her talk is Some Aspects of Research by Social Scientists of the Gender Gap in Science. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, before I start my talk, I would like to say I feel it's a great privilege uh, being here at this conference and being involved in this project because as a historian of science, I think we are writing a very important chapter in the history of science. Um, so, um, just to say, um, not just who I am, but where I come from, the International Union of History and Philosophy of Science, uh, I am the Secretary General of this one, the Division of History of Science and Technology of this union, and this diagram, not, going, not to go into detail, will give you an idea of how we sit in, as we say in French, between two chairs, that of the, um, uh, you know, of the hard sciences, which to be ICSU, and that of the human philosophy and the humanities. And as you can see, we have commissions in common with some scientific unions. So we really work um, in between disciplines. And I think that is true of most individuals as well as of the institution itself. And actually, if we want to ask what um, the social scientists have to say on the gender gap, which is quite a lot, I think that we will find that at least four disciplines, history, philosophy, sociology, and anthropology are involved. And um, that's why we would talk of a field and not a, a discipline. And the, um, the labels that you will find um, for, for people who are interested in these are social studies of science, or STS, which is usually short for um, science and technology studies, but sometimes a, you, means also science, technology, and society. So, uh, what do science and technology studies do? Um, first, I should say that they were created jointly uh, between the two world war and also uh, the Cold War was an important context of their uh, being set up by historians, sociologists, and by some scientists too. Um, so they're interested in scientific knowledge, technology systems, and society and how these interact. Um, and they tend to study scientific facts as products of scientists' investigations. And just like the scientists, the, um, uh, the facts they produce are socially conditioned rather than just objective representation of nature. This does not mean that uh, people who do um, science and technology study do not believe that uh, science produces, you know, true representations of nature, but I think we have to think maybe of the um, uh, wave uh, body duality here and apply it to science, both at the same time. Um, and I would also add that it is a great part of scientists' activity to strive to make their, um, you know, the, the, the science they produce in a context valid across all the contexts there are in the world and um, universally valid in that way. So, um, two, I would say there are two aspects to um, looking at science and technology and society. One is to uh, think of the nature of science and technology. Um, and um, for that, so again, regarding science and technology as social institutions that have distinctive structures, commitments, practices, and discourses and those vary across cultures and change over time. And uh, on the other hand, they're also interested in the impact and control of science and technology, because as we know, there are risks, benefits, and opportunities, and they have an uh, impact on peace, security, democracy, the environment, and also human values. And I will give some examples in, in what follows. So if we think about gender, how do these two aspects um, uh, how are our studies about genders on these two aspects. So firstly, the first aspect is how gender shapes the sciences as social institutions. And I think this is mainly what we have been discussing here. And, but reciprocally, how uh, does, do science and technology contribute to the construction of gender? This has been less discussed and I will um, say a few things about this because I believe both aspects are important to the gender gap in the sciences. 
Now, uh, in order to um, understand more about this second aspect, I think it's important to look at the life sciences, which are, uh, I think, mostly absent from our discussions here for um, reasons, you know, I would say contingent reasons, not that we are not interested, but we just do not have data. And uh, ex my experience in the history of science and in other fields is that, in fact, it's not just us um, the, for the uh, STS um, research. It, what there is to say about biological sciences and biomedicine is very different from what there is to say about uh, basically uh, uh, fields like physics, mathematics and engineering or computer science. It, um, the main reason is that um, the medical application of life sciences have some direct and very conspicuous impacts on individuals and society, on individuals and on their body. Um, so we will see more about that. Um, so the, the topics of research there include medical technologies and the way they are put to use in ways that affect human bodies. And also um, the definition of what the division between male, what, what, the, what is the male-female divide is, as you know, a hotly debated topic. And um, if only, you know, it was just X, double X or XY chromosomes, <laughs> things would be um, quite simple. And I mean, there is clearly a, a claim there by, from biologists that, you know, this is, a, this is a supposedly neutral definition. So um, one of the things that um, uh, the social science have done is to look at the gender gap. We know it's everywhere, not just in the sciences. But um, this is a field in which uh, biomedical technologies have some impact. Um, so if we look at the world population, and here, as in many places, this is not my research, so I usually indicate at the bottom of each slide who's done the research. And I should say all the slides are going to be put on the ICTP website after this conference. So if you're interested, you don't really need to take photographs. You'll have access to all the talks afterwards in that form. Um, so um, one uh, recent fact, a fact of the uh, 20th and 21st century, is the development of prenatal diagnosis, which includes sex discernment. Uh, techniques are uh, obstetric, ultrasonography, or, or, or also known as echography and amniocentesis. These are some of the techniques. And the findings is that in recent uh, decades, um, some countries have a very high uh, birth uh, sex ratio. The, 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 natural, the one that's regarded as natural being about uh, 105 boys for 100 girls, right? And um, the figures are again from uh, Christoph Gilmoto, so they are figures for uh, 2010. In China, um, this uh, birth sex ratio is 118, India 110, in Vietnam 111. Uh, already in 1990, uh, Amartya Sen has spoken about missing women and in his uh, talk, Gilmoto uh, says, no, these are about missing girls, missing babies. Um, other um, specialists question whether uh, the sex ratio uh, is necessarily the result of sex selective abortion. Um, the question is, could this be natural? But I think the... the I mean, it is not, I mean, it seems to be still an open question, but on the whole, I think predominantly people think that this is not, the, the, the phenomenon is not a natural one. And so this results in a um, gender gap uh, population uh, in China for the under 20s, over 25 million boys more than girls, and over uh, 12 million in India, with a very large number of social problems that this poses. Um, and here I would like to point out that it is the development of these uh, biotechnologies that make abortion, um, you know, uh, sex selective abortion possible in the first place. Um, now, that is not to say that there was no such um, 
uh, imbalance before, but it had to be, um, it, it was uh, reached by other means, like um, uh, female babies' infanticides. So here we see that the development of this um, new technology, uh, biotechnology, poses a number of, I mean, ethical and social problems. Um, that, you know, that is, uh, if we, and many feminists argue that, believe that women should have control over their bodies, so they may choose to give birth to a boy rather than a girl, and for some women, it changes the, uh, you know, the, the, their status in the family and the, well, the, the quality of their life significantly. Um, or do we say that this is, you know, discrimination over girls who are not even given a ch chance of being born. So uh, I think that this is a, a good example of how, um, you know, bio, um, biosciences, you know, um, bring in issues that have a very, very um, immediate and wide uh, social impact. Um, so further, I would like to say a few words on the feminist critique of science and technology. Um, they have... Um, I think they, they share a feature with um, other fields of, of uh, research on science and technology that is they focus very much on discourse and images and there will be an example of that at the end of my talk. Um, and the emphasis, they, they emphasize the use, the consumption of technologies in that, you know, having a prenatal diagnosis can be regarded as a, um, well, consu the consumption of the technology. Also another very important point is deconstructing the natural and I think that the very concept of gender, as opposed to the biological sex divide, is one such example of deconstruction of the natural. Um, uh, so, as I said, it's, uh, reproductive medicine, not just the biological science in general, have been a focus of, of such studies. And a well-known example, dating back to 2000, is Raina Rapp's book, Testing Women, Testing the Fetus, the Social Impact of Amniocentesis in America. Um, Rapp is an anthropologist who has done, um, well, I think it's called in English, participant observation, uh, following women who received prenatal diagnosis, and she did her uh, field work in New York. Um, and so, this is the, and, and she has uh, shown that basically uh, the way, in, you know, the, the way things go, uh, her argument is this is very much um, reproducing class divide in, in the way, you know, uh, uh, women with diagnosis can make their decisions and the way families are constructed. Uh, and another more specific field, I think, amongst um, uh, the, the, fe feminist, the feminist critique of science and technology is feminist epistemology. So in a nutshell, um, this is the study of how gender does and ought to influence our conceptions of knowledge, the knowing subject and practices of inquiry and justification. Um, they talk about situa situated knowledge um, with the idea being simply that the knower's social situation in part determined by gender, determines her or his knowledge, and therefore, knowledge is itself gendered, they argue. So, um, and this is, again, we have to, th to think of the ways in which what people know or think they know can be influenced by their own gender or other people's genders. Again, I think my final um, example will uh, be a an, an good example of that. Uh, and they wonder, you know, the, the questions they ask is, what, does it, what is it to know that I'm a woman? What is it like to be sexually objectified? How can we arrange scientific practice so that science and technology serve women's interests? This, is, this last question, I think, is not entirely um, uh, without relevance to what, some of what has been said here. And to give you an element of context, because you think, okay, this is the, you know, the social sciences, things are all different. Philosophy is one of the least women-friendly fields to the extent that in the early 2010, a number of women philosophers started the gendered conference campaign. This was a blog and basically every time a philosopher spotted a conference at which all the invited speakers were male, 
um, they just created a post on that blog. And this initiative created, a, a, you know, very, very um, lively discussions, whether it was a good idea to do this or not. But anyway, that they did, and they found plenty of conferences to put on that uh, blog, uh, which has now been discontinued. Um, some philosophers, um, I, I think, have paid a little more attention to this issue since then. But, so, and, um, but now I would like to come to uh, subjects with which I'm slightly more familiar, uh, personally. Um, and so I think, what can we say about uh, the role that science has played in the construction of gender stereotypes that we are fighting? Um, and I would like to start with where we are today or where we were maybe in the very recent past and uh, to talk uh, about the draw a scientist test. Marilyn has told me that there is a mathematical version of that draw a mathematician test. Uh, please note that these tests have been conducted in an English speaking environment because in French or Spanish or many other languages you cannot just say a scientist and it, you know, doesn't have a gender. So, uh, studies have been conducted for about 50 years and in 2002, um, uh, Kevin Finson, is, in his article that was an overview of all this, the, uh, the studies that had been done, uh, concluded that the perception of scientists as being male Caucasians working with <coughs> indoors with chemistry was still prevalent in 1999. And here you have a, a nice drawing that comes from a study of 1983. So, um, I want, so, I mean, to me as a historian, 1999 is not very far away. So, um, I will take it as a good approximation of the present, right. Um, how did this come about? And history of science can give you clues. Let's start from a, chemist, male, wearing a lab coat, wearing glasses, having moustaches, all these are uh, common, you know, common um, uh, features of children's drawing. Right. So, I'm going to try and say, what, what is the history of chemistry? So, in the first instance, you can say, okay, we'll look for ancestors. So, is chemistry uh, basically a genealogy of learned Caucasian males from alchemists that we find, for example, in antiquity or in the Middle Ages. That's the first possible narrative. Now, um, if we look a little harder, not much harder, but just a little more broadly, we find uh -uh, not Caucasian, right? Just a genealogy of learned men. And this is where mostly history of science is now. But if we look even harder, we find that one of the founders of alchemy was a woman known as Mary the Jewess uh, in the first century of the Common Era. Um, so she is uh, regarded as one of the founders and we do not have her own uh, writings but we have references to uh, what, she, uh, what she did. So this means that basically um, <laughs> writing history Results are never final, and we can always uh, look harder. And I would say this is a large part of what some historians of science have been doing recently. That is, we need to look for women, where there are really no women. So, in fact, there were women. Mary is not the only one. And um, if we look, if possible, you know, in different places, we find that in ancient Egypt, uh, somebody knows as Aganice or Athirta, who was an Egyptian princess, worked on astronomy and natural philosophy. We find that in, and that was 4,000 years ago. So, you know, I would say as long as we have historical records, we find women. Um, and um, just a little closer to us in Mesopotamia, we have a um, perfume maker who seems to be the early recorded distiller, of course, an essential technology in chemistry. In China, uh, beginning of the common era, we find Ban Zha, who uh, was a historian, a philosopher, a politician, an astronomer, and a mathematician. And in Chinese records, 
um, the earliest um, you know, master to student relationship that we have for the teaching of mathematics is Ban Zhao, teaching mathematics to uh, an empress. Um, and finally, better known probably to uh, most of you, Hypatia, who was in the, uh, who uh, died in the early fifth century, uh, and who was a philosopher, astronomer, and mathematician based in Alexandria. And there are more. If we, are, you know, come closer to us, this is my attempt to fit the, the list you find on Wikipedia for just the 17th and the 18th century. And actually, you can't see all of it because it, you know, the. the, the I would have had to make the font even smaller. So the point is, how do we make women visible? Um, and I would say, again, in science as elsewhere, because when you do history, you find that, yeah, it's the case in science, but it's the case everywhere in uh, all the societies we study. So one um, strategy that has been used a lot, and not only by historians, is to write biographies. It's certainly the most popular genre, and um, it's um, certainly um, a good way then of bringing female images into the mind of children before they draw a scientist, right? Um, uh, of course, biography can be and often is a way of celebrating its subject. And I'm thinking here of one of the first uh, biographies of a woman scientist, that of Marie Curie, written by her own daughter only three years after she died, um, after Marie Curie died. Um, there are also a number of autobiography and memoirs. And I would like to quote from one I have read recently, um, the um, uh, auto autobiography of Yvonne choquet um, She, who is a... Uh, a mathematician, someone who worked on the mathematics of relativity, so she worked at the uh, um, you know, intersection of maths and physics. Uh, in 1951, she was at the Institute for Advanced Study with her family, which was a husband and a daughter. And uh, she describes herself as basically having to go home early to relieve the babysitter uh, at the end of the day. So. Uh, one day, she said, I had noticed uh, when taking tea in the common room that some colleagues were sitting there, absorbed in playing that, Chinese ga that game of Chinese origin called Go. One of them once told me as I was leaving the common room before the babysitter left, obviously a woman can't be a mathematician. She has to look after her children. I snapped back. She can't stay late to play Go. Right. Um, so I think that this is an example. I think Yvonne choquet is a beautiful example of a scientist, a woman, a scientist. She writes her memoirs, but I find she doesn't devote, you know, she just, she just is herself and she doesn't make a big issue of being a woman. Only every now and then there is a little anecdote like this in her memoirs. Um, so, um, the, there are limits and there are difficulties to biography writing, limits by what you can say about women uh, scientists. And here I, I, um, uh, I was, my attention was drawn to it by a, um, a review that uh, Patricia Farah, who is a historian of science based in Cambridge, um, an article she wrote in Nature in 2013. So basically she says, in the past, women, bi biographer of women scientists thought that they had to make their women extraordinary. You know, it wasn't just enough to be uh, a, a woman and to have done science and to focus on what science has been accomplished by this person. And uh, she criticizes uh, her more recent writers for also finding that, well, you have to make your biography a selling opportunity and then again making women, you know, scientists, what she calls weird sisters. Um, and she concludes, converting female scientists into publishing opportunities may sell books, but it does the cause of equality in science no favors. Okay, the message being, well, a woman who does science doesn't have to have anything special about her. She just is doing science and that is what is important. Just like for a man doing science is what science she, she, she has done. Um, so I think that you know one of the, the messages there, and it's also the uh, one of the um, 
thoughts that came to me when preparing this thought and re uh, remembering uh, Ivan Chokebuya's biography is that there are as many ways of being a woman scientist as there are women scientists. And I think that the least we can do is to <laughs> allow women, you know, to, uh, as we do allow men, uh, to be unique. Celebrating is a perfectly respectable goal, and I think the, the word to celebrate has been mentioned a lot here, but it is not the goal of historical research. On the other hand, documenting is one of the goals of historical research. And uh, recently, a different uh, strategy has been adopted, and that is uh, that of prosopography. Prosopography is basically a collective biography, right? Very often you do it because you do not have enough material to write, say, uh, a, the biography of a single individual that belongs to a certain group. But if you look at a large number of individuals in all this group, you can find enough to, you know, describe, well, for example, the social circumstances and the, the type of trajectory that these uh, people will have had. And uh, again, the main point is that it does inject a social uh, dimension into uh, the history you're writing. So recently there have been, again, a very large number of uh, books about uh, women scientists that are prosopography. Uh, Patricia Farah wrote a book on science and suffrage in the First World War. Um, so here I have other cases, uh, other books. Uh, of course, one of them is the book um, uh, Margot uh, Lee Shetterly's book, on which the film we saw the other night uh, was based. Um, and um, I also mentioned, I think, uh, at some stage, no, maybe I did, it wasn't here, the, uh, this year is the International Li uh, the Year of the Periodic Table, which is uh, mainly an initiative of IUPAC. And so a number of historians of science have taken this opportunity uh, to publish a book called Women in Their Element, Selected Women's Contributions to the Periodic System, right? And, um, and um, last but not least, and I will draw on it later, I want to mention a dissertation that was completed this year by Isabelle Lemonon vaccin La Savante des Lumières Françaises, Histoire d'une Persona, Pratique, Représentation, Espace et Réseau. Uh, one of the achievements of this dissertation is that she has identified more than 40 women in France who um, engaged with science in the 18th century, and a number of them are in the later half of the century, um, women who worked for Jérôme Lalande um, uh, Nautical Almanac. So um, the, the, that's a rather early uh, instance of uh, human computers, because you know that before being machines, computers were women. So. Um, these are a few examples. So uh, now let me get back to representations, uh, to, to my representation of a chemist, and to just focus on the word representation, which um, is an important one in, in the social sciences. Social representations have been defined of, as ways of knowing characteristic of social reality that emerge in daily life during interpersonal communication and are directed toward comprehension and control of the physical social environment. Or, uh, or otherwise you can say common sense theories on key aspects of the world that allow individuals and groups to represent it and master it. So that is what this, the rep this representation of scientists is, a social representation. So, um, uh, and I propose to give you a very short history of representations of women mathematicians. And um, uh, that's quite heretical for a historian, but I will start now and go back. Uh, in the 21st century, I just want to very quickly uh, mention some comments on Maria Mirzakhani in the social media. First, when she was awarded the Fields Medal in 2014, right? Um, you can read the comments yourself. I'm not sure I want to repeat them, but basically you get the image. And when she uh, passed away three years later, sadly, um, somebody who was a friend of her also on the social media said, a genius, yes, but also a daughter, a mother, and a wife. Now, if we go back to the 18th century and we take 
another woman mathematician of the time, uh, Emilie du Châtelet, um, Madame du Défant, who was another, who was uh, another, um, she, she was a, um, a writer and a, uh, somebody who held a salon in Paris at the same time as uh, Madame uh, du Châtelet, described her as follows. Imagine a tall, lean woman with no bottom, with no hips, a narrow chest, two little tits that are barely visible, big arms, big legs, huge feet. I sort of censored what follows, which is about her face. Uh, I have to say that when translating this from French into English, and I got the help of a native English speaker, we could not quite render the, um, you know, the literary quality and the bitchy, um, or the nastiness of uh, the French completely, right? Uh, on the other hand, when uh, again uh, Emilie du Châtelet passed away, Voltaire uh, wrote, I have lost a friend, in French un ami, so a male friend, of 25 years, a great man who had the sole fault of being a woman and whom all Paris mourns and honours. So you can see that this is clearly a compliment, just like what was written on uh, uh, Mizahani after she passed away. Just a few words about Émilie du Châtelet because I don't think she has yet taken the place uh, she really should have in the history of science. She was uh, trained in mathematics with people like Maupertuis and Clairaut, and uh, she wrote a number of books. She, uh, in 1938, she submitted a dissertation on the nature and propagation of fire to the Royal Academy of Sciences of Paris, uh, who did not award it the prize because it was a call for uh, answering a call for uh, essays, but nevertheless decided this essay was worth publishing. She also wrote a book uh, called Institution of Physics, apparently to educate her son, which was translated into German and Italian in her lifetime. Uh, in 1946, she was mem made a member of the Accademia delle Scienze dell'Istituto di Bologna, and where there was already at least one other woman. And uh, finally, also her, one of her major work was the French translation of Newton's Principia, where uh, he exposed his major, major results from Latin into French. So I, the, she's 18th century. Now, 19th century, 20th century, uh, we comments on Soviet Fia Kovalevskaya, a female genius with a man's brain and the great mathematician Mobius. If a woman has mathematical talent, is if as, it is as, it is as if she had a beard, right? Um, any comment on mathematical genius there? Uh, I mean, he is not hers, right? Emmy Noether, um, van der Waarden, reported that we in Göttingen mostly call her der Noether, right? Okay, so I think you get the point there, right? Mathematics is masculine, it's male. You may not do mathematics and be a woman, right? I think that's how it works. Um, so, okay, we don't like it, it's still here, but why and how did this happen? And I think then um, what I will do now is to look at uh, the discourses on women and science in the 19th century, because, um, you know, there was more, there were more general views about women doing science or should not do science. The first example will not be mathematics, it will be botany. Botany uh, and women's education in England. Um, and again, I, here I'm drawing on uh, the research of uh, Sam George and uh, of, of Janet Brown, right? Um, in uh, 1796, Priscilla Wakefield wrote a book where she introduced the linear system of classification of plants. And the book was written uh, in the form of family letters. Two sisters correspond on their enthusiasm about botany. And in her introduction, she wrote, till of late years, botany has been confined to the circle of the learned, which may be attributed to those books, uh, to those books that treated of it being principally written in Latin, a difficulty that deterred many, particularly the female sect, from attempting to obtain the knowledge of a science thus defended as it were, from their approach. So, um, of course, this is about education, because boys went to schools and learned Latin, and women did not. Writing in vernacular languages had been a strategy since the 17th century. 
Descartes, when he wrote his geometry, in the preface he says, I have written this book in French so that even children and women can understand it, right? That, that is a, actually a, a very important issue historically, what language you write science in. And um, we should think that today, since the majority of the world does not have English as their native language, this is also an issue for us, I should include myself, since my native language is French. So, uh, one of the problems about Linnaeus classification and women accessing it at the time was that his classification of plants was based on the number and arrangement of their sexual organs. Uh, so, translating Latin into English, you know, might have resulted in, in something that um, some people may have, many people may have perceived as not proper. Um, on the other hand, it inspired other, um, other botanists, someone like Erasmus Darwin, who, uh, apart from being um, Charles' grandfather, was also a, a botanist himself, and he wrote a long poem called The Love of the Plants. And um, Janet Brown has studied this poem quite at length, and she has um, produced a table correlating the way um, Erasmus Darwin characterizes plants and the number of male and female organs that this plant has. And so, um, uh, you know, we, uh, yeah, you can see it there, maybe better than I can do, uh, but there are all these very, uh, you know, comforting plants that have one male and one female organ, so that's something, you know, familiar, uh, gentle, tender as a lamb, etc. characterization. And then, it becomes a little more complex because um, a lot of plants have got uh, only one female organ and at least two male organs. So you have, um, oh, you can read it, right? It's quite sweet. Um, you have this, uh, the one that there are unjealous husbands. And then, of course, it gets completely worse because you can see the figures there. Um, and you have the... Uh, uh, queen of the Seraglio, you have the Amazon, what not. Okay, so basically what is this? It's um, anthrop anthropomorphic projection and then metaphors to, you know, plants as uh, human beings. So, um, therefore, uh, plants become a very sexual subject and they are not for women. A clergyman and poet who was also a naturalist, uh, wrote a poem called The Unsexed Female, basically telling you how women who study in general and botany in particular stop being women. And a little, a, a little note, you can read the footnote for yourself, okay? So imagine <laughs> boys and girls botanizing together. Ooh. Right. I think it's, it's best to laugh at this kind of things because when you think about the fact that, you know, it was enforced in families, maybe it's not so funny. But anyway, um, Mary Wollstonecraft did not find it funny either. So she is a uh, uh, well-known feminist writer and in the a vindication of the rights of women, she um, uh, takes issue with another botanist, John Birkenhut, uh, who, um, in a letter to his son, wrote what is in red here, the lady who asked the question whether women may, uh, we may be instructed in the modern system of botany consistently with female delicacy, was accused of ridiculous prudery. Nevertheless, if she had proposed the question to me, I should certainly have answered, they cannot. Right. So, this is very clear, women cannot study botany because it's too sexual. And uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, of course, um, you know, shows, I think, proper anger there. So that's one reason why women should be kept apart from certain knowledge. And of course, anything that's got life in it as <laughs> will have sex. Um, but if we look at something else, now we've looked at the subject, the, the, the subject of study. Now, now let's look at the knowing, the situated knowing subject, right? What was the medical viewpoint on 
women in general in the 19th century. And here I will just again give you the case of Dr. Edward Clark, who was uh, an American physician and a professor uh, at the Harvard Medical School. He was the author of a book called Sex in Education, or A Fair Chance for the Girls, uh, very popular seven, and very controversial, 17 editions. Um, so, yeah, he argued that intellectual demands placed on boys were too hard for girls. They led to physiological disaster, nervous collapse, and sterility. Because, of course, the main thing about women is their reproductive function, and this has to be preserved. You know, if this doesn't work, then, as we will see, there is something very badly wrong with it. And he describes seven cases, you know, in support of his argument. One of is Miss E, who was the daughter of two enlightened person. Uh, she studied at a woman's college, and we're told, you know, that at the age of 21, she might have been presented to the public by the president of Vassa College or Antioch College or Michigan University as the wished for result of American liberal female culture. This is the first decade, uh, he wrote this in the first decade um, after um, women's college were created in the United States, so right, it's not just out of the blue. And then the case continues. Just at this time, however, the catamenial function, means the period, uh, began to show signs of failure of power. So, the, okay, he gives a lengthy description um, and basically she started having headache and headaches and so on and no appetite, ability to exercise and sleep. A careful local examination of the pelvic organs by an expert disclosed no lesion or displacement there, no ovaritis or other inflammation. Appropriate treatment faithfully persevered was unsuccessful in recovering the lost function. I was finally obliged to consign her to an asylum. Right, so this is not funny at all, actually. Um, well, um, sometimes when you read this literature, you laugh, and sometimes you really want to cry. Right. So the conclusion is not only the sciences, but all intensive study is dangerous for women. So is this really a nightmare of the past? Um, I would say maybe we shouldn't rejoice too quickly because um, if we look at the way the, the human body is depicted in um, anatomy textbooks in which uh, you know, that all medical students uh, use. So here I'm using two articles, one that uh, studies one century and the other one is a more recent one. But, um, so uh, what uh, Susan Lawrence and uh, Kay Ben Dixon have shown is that in the t century uh, between 1890 and 1989, anatomy texts have remained consistent in the disproportionate use of male figures or male specific structures to illustrate and to describe human anatomy. I think we've all seen these books. Um, the use of gender references in chapter headings, so that's for the language, and subheadings, male specific terms in discussions of shared anatomical structures and female to male homologies, all combine to present the normal human body as male. Um, and this is, they analyze this in particular with the description of uh, men and women's uh, genitalia. Um, so, uh, the, the, they basically conclude that um, how the human, how, seeing how the normal human body is routinely depicted as male or male-centered in illustration and language um, hardly invalidates anatomical knowledge, yet becoming a, aware of how much his anatomy dominates hers in texts designed for medical students exposes unnecessarily genitalia, useless comparisons, careless inaccuracy and errors. More important, this process reveals how far Western culture is from creating a non-gendered human anatomy, one from which both male and women emerge as equally significant and uh, intriguing variations, and with which the medical student can comfortably visualize his patient's anatomy, right? So the, the medical student still assumed to be a man. 
Right, so again, you know, since this was 1990, you will tell me, surely there has been progress in the past decades? Well, not so apparently, because there is a study, 2014, conducted at uh, Cardiff and at the University Paris Descartes. Um, and here I will just uh, quote their um, abstract. So uh, they, they did a survey, okay, they described their methods, and um, here they say, um, the hypothesis tested is that medical students perceive a gender bias that is reflected in the books they read and the tuition they receive, because the, the, you know, the anatomy books have not changed. Our findings suggest that while students recognize the importance of gender issues and do not wish to associate with sexism, most are unaware of the possible negative aspects of sexism within anatomy. In this respect, the findings do not support our hypothesis, means they had been too optimistic. Um, nevertheless, we recommended that teachers of anatomy and authors of anatomy textbooks should be aware of the possibility of adverse effects on professional matters relating to equality and diversity issues. So here are, you see, people like us, but in the medical sciences, making recommendations on how textbooks should be changed. Um, so, I would just like to make uh, three uh, concluding remarks. Uh, about 10 years ago, when I did what uh, the French have to do to be promoted to professorial rank uh, habilitation, um, the, um, you know, in, on the front page, I, I put this quotation from L.P. Hartley, the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. The reason why I wrote this is, uh, there is because my uh, field of study is basically 17th and 18th century, and I'm interested in how uh, mathematical and more broadly scientific uh, knowledge circulated between the two ends of the Eurasian continent at the time, so Europe and mainly China. And um, I wrote this because I wanted to say the past of Europe is as foreign to me as the past of China. And I think that is the conclusion I reached after studying the subject for 20 years. Well, in preparing this talk, I became very uncomfortably aware of the fact that, well, in some other respects, no, the past is not a foreign country. And I think I have um, shown you what I mean there. So scientific progress does not in itself guarantee the raising of the level of gender awareness. On the other hand, the social sciences have developed tools that are very effective for highlighting gender biases and gender gaps. So my last words are, let us all use the social sciences. Thank you. <laughs>